Hello everyone and welcome to another session of computational algebraic geometry. Today we're going to define what a Grobner basis is and this will allow us to perfect our division algorithm. Let's get started. First, let's fix our polynomial ring with k a field. I'm taking a polynomial ring over k with n variables and what's important here is that I need to fix a monomial ordering. And let's make the following definition. For an ideal inside of the polynomial ring R, we're going to define the ideal of leading terms in I. So this will be a monomial ideal generated by the leading term of all the polynomials in I. So a couple of notes on the notation. So I'm using little lt of i to denote this ideal generated by the leading terms of all polynomials f in i. So this is slightly different than in the book Ideals, Varieties and Algorithms where they use capital LT to denote the set of all leading terms. One thing to observe here is that since we're working over a field, all of the leading coefficients are invertible, which means instead of the leading term of f, I could have read, written the leading monomial of f. That would be fine. It would have given me the same ideal. So we've talked about monomial ideals. By definition, this is a monomial ideal. And in particular, I would like to make the following observation. So I claim that whenever you have a monomial inside of this ideal of leading terms, then there exists, in fact, a polynomial whose leading term hits that monomial. So we're just going to reduce it to the simple observations that we have made about monomial ideals. One of them was that uh, whenever you have a monomial inside a monomial ideal, then one of your generators divides this monomial. Now our generating set is just the leading terms of polynomials in I. Uh, and then by this uh, observation, Uh, one of the elements in this generating set must divide x of alpha, but then that's it. I multiply g with the, its, the inverse of its leading coefficient and whatever multiple is necessary to hit x alpha. This gives us our f, which has leading term x to the alpha. So in particular, this observation allows us to make the following definition. We say a Grobner basis for the ideal i is a bunch of polynomials in the ideal such that their leading terms generate the ideal of leading terms. And what happens is that Dixon's lemma says that the ideal of leading terms has a finite basis. And then from the previous lemma, we find the lifts to our original ideal. So we find polynomials g1 through gi, ga, whose leading terms form this finite basis for the ideal of leading terms. And then we have our Grobner basis. So we made this uh, observation now. I have not yet shown that a Grobner basis is in fact a basis for the ideal. This will follow from the next two results. So a surprisingly simple uh, observation comes next, but it's uh, very strong. We call it a proposition for, because it's very strong. We say that for any ideal and any polynomial in R, there exists a unique R, a polynomial, that will serve as the remainder of F modulo I. And uh, we say that it satisfies the following. So f minus r belongs to the ideal i, so that's half of what we expect for a remainder. And the second half says that no term of r belongs to the ideal of leading terms of i. Let's begin a proof by showing that R is unique. And remember this uniqueness is very interesting because we observed before that the remainder of multivariate division tended not to be unique. But if you do it right, there's a saying, and the right version is to impose the second condition. 
uh, then there will be a unique remainder. So suppose R and R prime both satisfy these two conditions. But then you can write R minus R prime, so their difference as follows. So I add then subtracted F and I get the following expression. But now, because they satisfy condition i, both f minus i prime and f minus r belong to the ideal. Therefore, this expression belongs to the ideal. But if r minus i prime was non-zero, then the leading term of this expression would have to belong to the leading term of i. But this contradicts condition 2, so none of the terms in R or R prime were inside of this ideal of leading terms, so this cannot happen. So we've contradicted that R minus R prime is non-zero, therefore uh, R and R prime must be equal. This proves uniqueness. Now let's show existence, and the proof of existence will also show the connection to the division algorithm. So what we're going to do, and this will be our first employment of the Grubner basis, is to pick a Grubner basis for i. And then we're going to use our division algorithm on f. So we divide f with respect to g1 through ga. This gives us the following expression. And what, one thing that the division algorithm did was that the remainder uh, had no term that was divisible by the leading terms of the GIs. But the GIs are a Grubner basis so that their leading terms generate the ideal of leading terms. So uh, R satisfies our condition 2. R clearly satisfies I because F minus R is simply a uh, sum of QI GIs, which is in the ideal. So the condition i is satisfied, and we end the proof here. We've shown existence and uniqueness. So although this uh, result was very simple, it has a torrent of conclusions. And now let's grab all the conclusions that we can get. So this is just a matter of rephrasing this observation. Okay, so I pick a Grubner basis for i, I take a polynomial f. Uh, the one thing that was clear from the proof was that the remainder of, of f with respect to the Scribner basis g1 through ga depends only on f and i. Maybe I denote my remainder here by r as usual. So you, you remember that before the remainder could depend on the order of the dividing polynomials, so how you have ordered them. Here, let alone ordering the gi's, you could, in principle, take another Grubner basis, even that doesn't change the remainder. The remainder depends only on f and i. So the other uh, conclusion of this is that f is inside the ideal if and only if that the remainder is zero. Again, there was a catastrophic example where we divided a polynomial inside an ideal by a bunch of polynomials that spanned the ideal, but we now know in retrospect they were not a Grubner basis, and the remainder was non-zero. So it says that whenever you're working with a Grubner basis, the remainder will solve your ideal inclusion problem. So it will be able to check whether or not an element is inside the ideal by simply doing this uh, polynomial division. And an immediate consequence of this statement is that the polynomials G1 through GA, so a Grubner basis, in fact generates the ideal. So let's prove these statements one by one. So I said the remainder depends only on F and I. Well, this remainder r is the r from previous lemma, from previous proposition. And you, you see that there was no mention of the Grubner basis during the statement of this proposition. That we said that there exists a unique r satisfying these two properties. The division algorithm produces such an r. We use this in, uh, during the proof, uh, satisfying these two properties. Since this r did not depend on the Grubner basis for its definition, 
it of course uh, depends only on f and i, which was involved in this uh, definition. And for the to prove this second claim, we say so if f is in i, then this r equals zero satisfies the properties of the r inside the proposition. Therefore, this must be the remainder upon division. And the, the, the inverse is clear. So if r is zero, then f clearly is inside the ideal. And finally, obviously, if f is inside the ideal, then the division produces remainder zero, so that f will be an expression in terms of gi's. So that f is inside the ideal generated by g1 through ga. So that gives us part of the inclusion, the reverse inclusion is trivial. So let me highlight the following. First, uh, if we have a Grubner basis, then we can solve the ideal membership problem. So that means given a polynomial, we ask if f is inside the ideal. Right, so we just perform division by the Grubner basis. The second condition here says the remainder is zero if and only if f belongs to the ideal. And this ideal membership problem was what was open until the 1960s, until Buchberger settled it in his PhD thesis. And another conclusion that the Grubner basis forms a basis for the ideal is that it gives us Hilbert's basis theorem. saying that every ideal in the polynomial ring has a finite basis. So we used Dixon's lemma to pr um, prove that there exists a finite basis for the monomial ideal of uh, leading terms of i, and then we lifted the generators to Grubner basis in i and proved that this Grubner basis is in fact a basis. So uh, given i and f, the r that we keep talking about so that's uh, the R satisfying properties I and II of the proposition above. This is called the normal form of F with respect to the ideal I. And now we can make an observation that we made at the very beginning of uh, our discussion about division, is that dividing things was about finding a canonical representation for the quotients. Uh, let's, let's make this clear. So I have an R, our polynomial ring, modulo an ideal I, and I'm saying that there exists an isomorphism of k-vector spaces to r modulo the leading terms of i. So the right-hand side is exceptionally simple because this is a monomial ideal. So I'm just modding out by monomials, which makes it very easy to evaluate right-hand side. The left-hand side is in principle very complicated. And what we have is that f here goes to its normal form. There's a very interesting conclusion here. Although the rings on the left are mod i and on the right are mod lti, they're very different as rings in general. It's true that they are deformation equivalent. So there's the notion of a moderately weak uh, version of deformation. So you can deform something smooth into something singular even, but preserving many of its arithmetic properties. And it turns out that these two things will be deformation equivalent in that sense. And remember ideals uh, are generated by a bunch of polynomials, and R mod i really uh, represents the zero locus of these polynomials. So it represents the variety cut out by these polynomials. So this is saying that any affine variety can be deformed into a variety, an affine variety, defined as the zero locus of monomials. So we will make good use of this uh, sometime in the future. Let's do one very simple example to see what this normal form looks like. So I take the polynomial generated by x plus y inside of the polynomial ring generated by x and y, and then I'm going to use the Lex ordering. So that x here is my leading term. So it's easy to convince yourself that the leading term of i should be generated by x. And now we have the isomorphism here in the following case, k, x, y modulo x plus y becomes isomorphic as k vector spaces to k x y modulo this ideal of leading terms which is naturally isomorphic to k y. We talked about this before that there seemed to be a choice involved in whether we should identify this quotient uh, with k y or with k x. 
and you see that this choice is now settled by our ordering, by our monomial ordering. So if we had chosen an ordering where y was greater than x, then our ideal of leading terms would be y, and this quotient would be identified with kx. So that uh, the choice of ordering has settled this isomorphism. I should also mention that in this particular instance that this uh, isomorphism is a ring isomorphism, not just a vector space isomorphism. Well, okay, so we have done as much as we could uh, without being able to compute Grubner bases. But if we want to go any further, we need to figure out how we should construct Grubner bases given an ideal. And this is what we turn to next.